If the cosmos is young, as the Bible claims, then how can we see so much of it? Today, when a photon of light is emitted from a star at the edge of the universe, it will not arrive at the Earth until billions of years later. The size of the universe is a mystery that plagues creation science and in the eyes of many, discredits the Word of God. Is the Bible wrong about the age of the earth? Cosmology has been a tough problem for young Earth creation science. To solve difficult problems, though, it helps to know that there is an answer. I found by repeated testing that the Bible is scientifically reliable. So now I use that knowledge as a roadmap to guide me into new scientific territory. I also use present scientific knowledge knowing its limitations. But I require any theory, any new theory I generate, to conform to what Scripture clearly says. My best scientific insights, including my creation cosmology, come from following that procedure. Now, for example, here in Psalm 147, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Now, that word telleth in the Hebrew means to count. So God counts the number of the stars. That implies that they're finite in number, and that's emphasized by Him saying He calleth them all by their names. In contrast, verse 5 says that God's understanding is infinite, or in Hebrew, uncountable. So God's understanding is uncountable, but the number of stars in our cosmos is countable, or not infinite. So I can use that as a clue to guide me in making a cosmology, and I do, and many other scriptures the same way. During creation week, God formed the stars and galaxies on the fourth day, and their light arrived no later than the sixth day. How did light traverse so much space so quickly? Did God just miraculously, by divine fiat, move the light across those billions of light years of space? Or can science offer any insights into how a physical process that normally requires billions of years might have occurred in a matter of just hours or days. Light itself is not the answer because its speed is fixed by the medium of space. Light behaves much like other wave phenomena, such as sound in air, or even ripples on water. Today, most people believe that space is, to put it simply, nothing. But now physicists are beginning to realize that relativistic effects are best explained if space is actually something rather than nothing. Einstein came to this conclusion and spoke about it in an address delivered in 1920 at the University of Leiden. The title of the address was Ether and the Theory of Relativity. Einstein summarized his position in a singularly succinct statement by saying, According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. 
The term ether, as Einstein used it here, means space itself. And dictionaries today still use that term in that way. For example, here in Webster's Dictionary, a medium that in the undulatory or wave theory of light permeates all space and transmits radio waves or light waves. Now, Einstein's first theory, the special theory of relativity in 1905, tried to do away with the idea of an ether, but he found later on that his general theory of relativity, which he introduced in 1916, required an ether. Many people today are still under the mistaken impression that Einstein's theory of relativity does away with an ether, but as a matter of fact, a sophisticated ether is necessary to the theory of relativity for it to work. Since the speed of light is fixed by the medium of space, that leaves time as the only variable that can explain how distant light could have arrived at the Earth during creation week. Time is merely the universe in action, the rate at which physical processes transpire. Science has discovered that physical processes and time can slow down when space is stretched, warped, or bent, which is actually quite easy to do. All it takes is a little matter. We can, in fact, detect the effect right here on Earth, but it requires very precise time measurement. The atomic clock is the most accurate chronometer ever invented. 2,980,000,000. Its total error is just one microsecond or just a millionth of a second per year. 2,988,000,000. That's less than one part error out of 30 trillion. It would be like counting every blade of grass on 10,000 football fields and missing only one. It's two billion nine hundred two two. It turns out that two atomic clocks, one at Greenwich, England, at sea level, and the other at Boulder, Colorado, at five thousand feet above sea level, will run at different rates. Time running at different rates right here on Earth may sound like science fiction, but it is pure science fact. Time runs at different rates because the mass of the Earth distorts space and produces a gravity well. England, being lower in elevation, is further down in the well compared to Colorado. Thus, time at Greenwich runs slower. To us, there is absolutely no sensation of time running at different rates because all physical processes are affected in precisely the same manner. The only way to verify a difference in time is to compare the same process running at two different depths in a gravity well. That is precisely what has been done with the atomic clocks. After a year, these clocks will measure an actual time differential of five microseconds. Many people have a hard time understanding how we can bend space. What direction can we bend space in? In order to understand what the theorists think of when they imagine bent space, we're going to have to do away with one of the dimensions of our three-dimensional space. So let's take this dimension and squash it down to a flat plane. Now we're all little flat two-dimensional creatures existing in this flat plane. Now let's wrap the flat plane into the surface of a sphere. Now the flatlanders still can't perceive that they're on a sphere. They can't perceive the air inside the sphere or the air outside the sphere. So their scientists call that air hyperspace. And the space that they exist in is simply the surface of this sphere, and that's all they can perceive. This corresponds very closely to one version of the Big Bang Theory called the closed space version. And in that version, if you just travel, if a flatland creature travels on the surface of the space that he exists in, eventually he'll come back to his starting point. Now, how do we bend space? Imagine a big mass which comes along and puts a dent in this sphere. Suddenly, the sphere now has a big dent in it. 
Well, the Flatlanders can't actually perceive the din, but it is there nonetheless, and that bending of their space they perceive as gravity. Oof.